Hi there, and welcome to the Homestead Education Podcast. Do you have a homestead, farm, or just dream of a rural life? This is a show to help you and your kids grow your own food and grow as a person. I'm your host, Cody Hanner. I'm a homesteader, homeschool mama six, and small town enthusiast. I was raised by an old school rancher and blessed by the grace of God to have been exposed to so much of what rural life has to offer. Join me every week to talk about homesteading, homeschooling, and growth with a homestead education. Hi, welcome back. I just want to remind you that you can get all of my homestead science books on my website for a new way of teaching agriculture to today's youth and aspiring homesteaders by focusing on small-scale farming and self-sufficiency. If you're a school or co-op and need invoicing, please feel free to reach out to me directly. So this week is kind of, it's like my slowdown week. And I decided to share that with you guys rather than have a guest on or um, have like a big teaching topic or something. I just really wanted to share how I'm slowing down. I've really felt a pull towards it. Um, probably because of all my travel this year, but I kind of do this every year right around this time. Like I almost want to like batten down the hatches. We have all of our Christmas presents. Um, we have stuff for Christmas dinner and there is nothing on my 4-H schedule, my teaching schedule, my travel schedule, nothing like that until after the first of the year. And I am just ready to kind of dial that all back in. Um, I'm getting... I, I do have one um, launch that I'm doing this week, but um, after that, I'm going to be able to just kind of keep things quiet for a little while. So I'm really looking forward to some reset time for our house. Um, anybody who's watching this um, with video, you can see like all my conference swag behind me just piled up um, because it's not in the truck traveling. So and um, that needs to be gone through inventory done. There's just so much that I, I'm just ready to reset and start next year. Um, I'm gonna have some good things for you guys. Uh, I'm talking to some wonderful people for guests. There's going to be a lot of stuff happening on our homestead that I hope you guys all um, take advantage of learning with us. Um, some of these things I already know, um, just from my background in agriculture and uh, farming, but we're starting a, a store on the farm, which I've talked about a few times. And there's just going to be some regulatory things that come along with that, that even though I've worked with them before, every time is like a whole new experience. And the laws change constantly. So I'm going to be documenting a lot of that mainly through YouTube, but it's going to be on the podcast and it's going to be through my blogs. Um, and that's why we switched to only doing one podcast a week instead of two so that we could really focus um, our time that we would normally spend on the second podcast on putting together uh, YouTube videos on how to set up a store, how to run kind of a commercial homestead operation. Um, so with that, while we're having some quiet time, uh, my daughter and I have been doing a lot of baking and candy making. And everyone thinks, well, yeah, that's Christmas time. You're doing that anyways. But actually what it is, is we are trying recipes so that when we open the store, we have more to offer than just meat and eggs. We want, um, it's a little bit of a drive to get to our location. And so we want our store to be a destination spot. So we do plan on having a small petting zoo probably one day a week. Um, we want to have lots of goodies, um, items that people really look forward to, like cookies and candies. And um, I'm working with some local vendors to see who wants to sell in our store. We have some close friends that will be putting some products in our store. And then Savannah and I, my daughter, we are also making lip balms and chafe sticks, um, wax candles. We're perfecting some of our raw dairy products like butters and yogurt so that we can sell those in the store as well. Um, and there is, you know, some of those are cottage foods. Um, and I'll have to have licenses for them. Some of them just go directly through my um, small herd exemption for my raw milk. So just a lot of deciding what's worth our time and also uh, making sure that I have the correct regulations in place to be able to sell these products. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, I'm trying to decide how to decorate my store, I guess would be the best way of putting it. So please feel free and spam me with all your inspirational ideas. You can send those straight to hello at the homesteadeducation.com or just, you know, hit me up on Instagram or Facebook. I love seeing all this stuff. Um, 
Now, another thing I'm going to be doing is, you know, it's really every year, this time of year, I do my planner um, and get it all ready for the coming months. And that includes my seed starting planner. And I'm going to be starting everything like a month ahead of time inside from what I normally do, because I want to be able to have larger plants for my store. I want to be able to have fresh herbs to sell. And we are going to be doing a plant sell again this year in May. So probably like Memorial Day weekend ish. And that's going to be our grand opening of our store, even though I'll probably do a soft opening around March. Um, and my two cats are locked in the office with me. So I keep hearing noises. <laughs> um the next is we have two butcher lambs. Um, they are going to the butcher in about three weeks. This is really exciting. It's going to be our first time selling lamb off the property. Uh, we have never actually raised sheep. Um, these lambs that I per that I have, I purchased um, from 4-Hers that didn't make weight. So I really felt like that was a great way for me to kind of give back to the community, help some kids out that didn't get to sell at auction. And then I know that I have a really quality product that I'm selling off my property. If we decide to raise, um, to do this differently next year, we still probably would be buying from 4-H kids, but it would be 4-H kids that are breeders is who we'd actually be buying from this next year. Um, I still may consider buying some underweight lambs um, after fair in August, but we'll kind of just see how it goes, what the need for lambs are. There's a there's a couple other um, farm store type places in our county that uh, one of them is really known for their lamb and I don't want to step on their feet on their toes. They have an amazing product. Um, I just want to be able to have a variety in my store. We're kind of known for our pork and I really feel comfortable sticking with that, but I just want to be able to have a variety of other products, uh, for people who do decide to make that 45 minute drive. Uh, now if you live anywhere in like the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, North Idaho, Washington, parts of Montana. Um, we sell hogs off of our property. We sell a lot of 4-H piglets, feeder piglets. We sell whole hogs, half hogs. We do pay as you grow, which means you do a monthly payment to us for six months. And then when you've paid for your pig in full, we schedule a butcher date for it. And then you just have to pay the butcher. Um, we also sell retail pork packs. Um, that probably wouldn't be really worth a drive, but we have customers that drive all the way from Seattle. It's like an eight hour drive to get piglets from us just because there's such, there's just not enough breeders in our area. Um, and we do have a, I don't want to say that we have the lowest price because it does fluctuate, but we aren't really trying to price gouge either. So, um, I charge a little bit more for my 4-H pigs because I have to give them some different vaccines that are required by our county fair. And I provide education for the kids all the way through. So, and there's more paperwork involved. Um, anyways, though, if you are interested in getting on our wait list for piglets, um, signing up for the pay as you grow program, any of those types of things, go ahead and reach out at info at hannerhomestead.com. So hanner, H-A-N-N-E-R, homestead.com. Um, we do have a website that's hannerhomestead.com. I'm still kind of... Um, in the works on it, but it does have all of our contact information on there if you want to go ahead and check that out. Um, and I'll link that in the show notes. So updates on my survival course. Um, I had hoped to have it out a couple days ago, just, um, you know, the holidays, doing things with the kids. I'm just not um, getting all the writing done as quickly as I would like. We have all of our videos done. They're all uploaded to the website. Um, it's, I mean, I'm going to be wrapping it up in the next couple of days and I'm so excited to get it out to everybody. Um, it's going to be a 15 lesson mini course, so it could be done, you know, just during spring break, it could be done with a co-op over 15 weeks at one time a, a week. It could have, you know, I'm making it really flexible where you could like go into class and just do the project and then send the kids with some reading homework. I mean, really just however you want to do it, but I'm making sure that you have all the supplies that you need or like, you know, all the resources that you need and supplies listed and ideas on what to do with them and some teaching points so that this class can be really easy for someone to teach, even if they don't have a lot of experience in survival and wilderness. And if you do have a lot of experience in survival and wilderness, kind of what this does is it still gives you that outline of what order you should teach it in, ideas for projects that you can do with kids. Um... Because I mean, even when I wrote my homestead science curriculum, I was writing it for my kids and I know this stuff, but I had sought out a curriculum that had it in order for me. So I kind of knew 
my starting points and then I could add to it. And so that makes the survival one really fun is because even if you're comfortable with it, it gives you the bones, like the, the skeleton, the frame of teaching it. And then you can add to it the things that you know. So <clears throat> it's got tons of hands-on activities. It's got the resources. It's got fun facts. Um, you can join the wait list now over at the homesteadeducation.com forward slash survival. Um, if at the time that you're listening to this podcast and you go over there and it doesn't have a wait list, it just has a price, that means it's available. So you can go ahead and um, purchase it if you're wanting it. Um, it's just going to be a download. So I'm going to be able to keep the price really reasonable. So we are talking about slowing down. Now, I just gave you a list of a bazillion things we're doing. So you're thinking, how are you slowing down, woman? But <laughs> Um, it's when my way of slowing down is being productive in other ways. Um, and that, that's, oh, that's okay. And I'm actually going to get to some of those types of things in this conversation, but the way I'm slowing down is focusing on books. And I just feel like this is a really great time of the year to talk about books because as the days get shorter, you're inside longer, you want to read more, you want to read with your kids more. Um, maybe you want to ask for some books for Christmas. And so this just seemed like a really great topic to cover today, especially because later in the month, I'm going to be talking more about how to jump st start your homestead for the year. Um, so you'll probably want to take notes. There's some good information here, but everything will be linked in the show notes as well. Um, so last year I rediscovered goodreads.com. Um, I'd known about it, but I was just playing around um, and came across it again. And I saw that they have a challenge. Like every year you can challenge yourself to read a certain number of books. And I decided to go with 50. I was like, this is a big goal, but I'm doing a lot of traveling. So I'll have tons of time to read, working in the garden, listening, you know, to books on tape, because I consider those reading as well. You're still taking the time to absorb that information. Um. I didn't reach 50. I didn't even come close to reaching 50 now, but I, I don't feel bad about this because what I'm, I, I have completed 15 books. Um, I started flipping through like my audible and my, um, Kindle books and like the stack of books I have next to my bed. And I've started or almost completed all of them. And I know that sounds crazy. Like my husband goes, I can't even like focus on one book at a time. How do you read seven? And it's because I have seven from very, seven very different categories. So, you know, I'll have one on agriculture, one on, you know, like the history of agriculture, one on homesteading, one on parenting, um, a novel, a self-help book, a business book. And it just depends on what mood I'm in as to what I want to read. And because they're so different, like my storylines or something like that aren't getting crossed. I'm just gaining positive information whenever I feel like picking up a book. So I went through all of those and I'm actually going to come really close to my goal of 50. And so I was like, wow, I think I can do this again next year. So I will be doing the challenge again next year. Um, you can find me on Goodreads. I have, I have a profile over there. It's, you know, goodreads.com forward slash Cody Hanner, K-O-D-Y-H-A-N-N-E-R. Again, I'll link all this in the show notes. And we can like be friends over there, kind of like Facebook, but you can put in your reading goals too. You can see all the books I'm reading. I can see all the books you have on your like want to read list. And I just think it's really fun to share information that way. Um, Now, another thing is I don't feel like my kids are reading as much as I'd like them to. Now, you know, we're in that digital age where they have their cell phones all the time, especially my teens. Um, my youngers don't know how to read yet. I do read to them a couple times a week, but not as much as I'd like to. Um, we do as a family love listening to audiobooks. So when we travel, we listen to a ton. Um, we actually just, when we did our cross country trip, we listened to the entire one second after series. Um, great, great series. If you're kind of into like that survivalist government type thing, <laughs> Um, it gave us some really good ideas on things we want to stock up on just in case, you know, even if we're looking at a three day shutdown or longer, I mean, where we live, we've lost power up to a week before. So, um, I think it just really kind of opened up not only mine and my husband's minds to what we want to stock up on more. It really helped the kids understand why 
even though we chose to homestead for our health and for the lifestyle, that there is a little bit of a prepper vibe behind the whole thing. And I think the kids are understanding that a little bit more now. So, um, I wrote a blog this week, um, on what my homestead kids are reading and not only have they read like they've read most of the books. The ones they haven't are series written by friends of mine that I really like know where their heart is coming from. And I know that these are, you know, traditional books, they're books about homesteading and rural life. I mean, it's really hard to find clean, engaging books for kind of middle of the road kids. And when I say middle of the road is, you know, of course we're Christians, but we aren't super strict on the media that they take in because I feel like it's there And I want to be able to guide them through it rather than um, shelter them from all of it. And then they're exposed to it all at once when they like go to college or something. Um, They, I also will not allow them to read any of the, I don't even know the proper like genderqueer style books. Um, And we're also not big on graphic novels. I know there's some kids that can glean a lot of information from them and read multiple of them. My kids, they kind of hyper-focus and will read the same one over and over again. And I don't feel like they get anything positive out of it. So um, I am struggling a little finding books that I really love for my teens. But for my younger kids, there's a whole blog on my website that I put up this week of um, books that I love for the like younger kids and then like some junior high level books that my older kids have already gone through that I just think are great. They show traditional families, you know, they're, um, they're a lot of them have homeschooled kids in them. So, I mean, that's another one is most books are, you know, mainstream public school, um, type scenarios, which my kids don't have, so they don't resonate with them as well. So I was really happy to find a lot of, um, homeschool style books or books where the main characters are homeschooled. And so I've listed all of those. Um, now with my teenagers, I am encouraging them. You know, I've picked up a couple novels here and there. You know, they come over and they're like, do you have any, you know, they, they'll read like an animal husbandry book just for fun. Like my son's reading the history of a farm mechanics right now. Um, but I want them to be able to tell and retell and write and <clears throat> resonate with a good story. Um, there's there's reasons for it. There's reasons why literature is so important. I was not an English major. Um, I was not an education major. So I, I don't, I, I don't know what I'm looking for right there. And I think all of us as homeschool moms, we're just like, we just know they need to read, <clears throat> which again, I'm happy when they're reading the nonfiction style books. But I, like I said, I want them to be able to read a whole story, to resonate with another teen, to have that empathy, to know the thoughts that are going through other teens' heads and things like that. And I am struggling finding good books um, there. Now, my son, he has started reading biographies by or memoirs by people that are in the fields he's interested in, like farming. Um, So next, he's going to be reading Derek Josie's book, um, An Industry Worth Fighting For. He's a um, commercial dairyman. Um, A lot of people know him as the Tillamook Dairy Farmer or... Um, the honest farmer, something like that. Um, He's um, all over social media. So my son's reading his uh, autobiography or memoir on farming right now. So, you know, there's, he's still getting some of that style of storytelling, but if you guys know of some good, clean books for teens, especially if they have some sort of rule, um, theme. I would love to hear those as well. So again, feel free to spam me at hello at the homestead education.com or um, via social media on Instagram or Facebook. I would love to hear all your ideas. I don't even mind like a clean romance line in it because as teens, you know, romance stories are starting to become um, appropriate just as long as if, if I don't want to be blushing myself. And I have read some of these books where I am blushing myself. Um, But I mean, a nice uh, romance story would be, they're sweet, you know, and it's okay. So if if you have those, don't feel like you have to like, hold those back because they aren't, I don't know, for whatever reasons you would think you need to hold them back, don't. I want to know about them. (laughs) Um, 
So now that I've begged you for some book titles, let me tell you some that I've read this year. And some of them, my kids have read parts with me or listened to via audiobooks. And, um, you know, my daughter, she jokingly, she's like, I hate writing to town with you because I always learn something, you know, but um, <clears throat> she wasn't complaining too much. So I've already mentioned, so the books we read this year, um, I the One Second After series, that was, of course, great. I just finished Animal Vegetable Junk, A History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal. I absolutely loved this book. It gave a history that like coincided with everything I learned in majoring in commercial agriculture, but gave like the flip side of the story. And so I, I mean, I just ate it up. It was so interesting. It did take me all year to read, but like I said, I'm reading like seven at a time and it was on my phone, which I tend to not read eBooks as much as I do like a physical book sitting in front of me because it reminds me to read it. Um, the next one, these are in no order except for like w the order I picked them up off my shelf today. <laughs> the next one was uh, Jill Winger's Old Fashioned on Purpose. This just came out maybe two months ago. I love Jill. I always love what she has to say. I've been an avid listener of her podcast for years. We've now met a few times, traded podcasts. Um, so I could really just like almost imagine her telling me this story. And there's a part in it where it talks about how not everybody relaxes the same way. And it made me feel so seen um, as a person because I'm not the type that can go take a bath and relax. Like I take work with me to the bathtub. I, I bring a book or something because that's the time that it's really quiet for me and I can focus on a more anal analytical book. Um, and my husband doesn't really understand that. He's like, why don't you just go relax? And I'm like, well, I don't relax. That, that is my relax. It's letting my brain think in a different way. Um, another one she talks about is, you know, using her relaxed time is working in the garden and, you know, pulling weeds. Sometimes I'll take, you know, an audiobook with my headphones out to the garden and listen or listen to a podcast, but sometimes it's just me out there pulling weeds. And that is my relax. That's my happy time. Um, starting seeds. I will actually lock my family out of the mudroom so that I can start seeds by myself. Um, sometimes I let them come in and help and that's okay. But that is how I relax. I switch to working with my hands. And Joe Winger talks about that a lot in her book. And like I said, I felt really super seen in that book. Um, you know, I think she wrote it more to give a broader audience an idea of how you can be more self-sufficient, how you can slow down your life. Um, mostly because I live a fairly parallel life to her. I'm already doing a lot of those things, but it, it felt very validating to have somebody else say the same thing. So I definitely suggest heading out and checking out that book. The next book I don't suggest, but I'm gonna tell you about it anyways. <laughs> um, it's called Bet the Farm. There's actually two of them. Um, the one I'm referring to, I think, is is by um, Beth Hoffman. And oh my gosh, I'll probably get some backlash for this one. But I can't not say something because this book actually kind of made me mad. She gave a lot of really good information on how to get farm subsidies, um, for small farms or for farms that are switching from a more commercial standpoint to an organic or a grass fed, um, the finances of getting a farm, the realities of passing down a farm from one generation to the next. I really liked the information she gave, but having been someone who grew up in California and I now live in another state. Now I grew up in very rural California but I had some ties to San Francisco Bay Area um, because my dad had shipyards down there. And then my sister ended up um, going to beauty school in San Francisco and staying in the area. And oh, all the best explanation that I can come up with of how this made me feel is it felt like a typical Californian going to a rural state, in this case, it was Iowa, and trying to change how they do things through a very idealistic and, for lack of a better word, liberal mindset. 
I was very disappointed in the way she portrayed rural life. Um, I did listen to the whole thing. So like I said, I feel like the information in it was actually good. But the way that it was presented just rubbed me the wrong way. And, you know, I'm not trying to sit here and be like, oh, I'm this conservative Idahoan and I hate all liberal Californians. <laughs> but I kind of do. <laughs> um, but I, gosh, I'm like, I'm embarrassing myself. It's It was very, um, very biased against rural traditions and rural people. And I think that what that's going to do is it's going to encourage other people to come into rural communities and try to change how they do things. And that is something that those of us who've grown up rurally, and yes, I grew up in California, but it was a very rural part of California. Um, and a just different mindset than the majority of the population. Actually, honestly, the majority of the louder population, because I would think, I actually think the majority of the people that I have ever known in California think very similar to me. And I mean, as we're seeing the mass exodus out of there, just goes to show that um, maybe we aren't as much of a mi minority as everybody wants, uh, or as, you know, the media and certain members of government um, want to lead us to believe that we are. So I'm just going to kind of cruise on past that, read the book if you want, listen to the book, um, take the information in, um, don't try to change rural life because we like it just the way it is. <laughs> um, the next, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations. I should have probably wrote down the authors of all these books, but like I said, I um, there are going to be links to all these things. So this book, I thought I am not reading an entire novel about dirt. Um, my least favorite class in college was uh, soil science. I thought it was horrible. I fell asleep in it. My legs fell asleep in it. I mean, it was just like, it was so exhausting and boring that my whole body just shut down. Like that's how I literally felt about soil science, but I know how important soil science is. And so, um, I mean, I had to have it for school anyways, but now as an adult, like and having my own farm and stuff, I understand. I I'm glad that I have that basis. Now, this book, though, it was suggested to me by um, Sophie Ng, um, Sprinkled with Soil. Um, she just released a really cool book, The Nourishing Asian Diet. Um, so if you get a chance to check out her book as well, that I mean, definitely do that. But she suggested this book to me. And I thought, yeah, again, like, I don't want to read a whole thick book on the history of soil. So I did listen to it while I was gardening this year. And it was life changing. Like, I, I cannot tell you, like, it wasn't the boring soil science of how soil was created over bazillions of years or whatever. Like, this was literally a story of how as humans, we have destroyed the topsoil and what we need to do to fix that and how we've been doing it for eons. So read it. I just, I can't tell you how good this book was. Um, this, let's see, free range kids. Who was that a good one? My, my husband and my kids and I listened to it on the way to a conference and it was, I think it helped both my husband and I get more on the same page with a lot of things with our kids. And I think it helped our kids understand where we were coming from, especially our teens. Um, it's just things you know, we talk about, oh, things are so different. Our kids can't live the way we used to live. Now, I don't want my doing some of the things we used to do, like playing video games and eating SpaghettiOs, but I want my kids to be able to have freedoms and use their imaginations and work their problems out and have problem solving. And I don't want to be a helicopter mom. And this book tells you very well how to not be a helicopter mom. Um, And it makes me feel good about the things I do let my kids do, like walking a mile to the store through the hot fields. We live in a very rural place, but I mean, I used to ride my bike to the store down a highway. So, I mean, I wouldn't let my kids try, ride that highway, I don't think, but I let them do it here. So I'm more worried about bears <laughs> than bad guys, but I make them take a dog. So we're good. Um, The Self-Driven Child was another book that I read this year. 
Um, it's by a psychiatrist. I liked his um outlook on a lot of things, but I really we pulled really far away from child psychiatry when we were dealing with a lot of issues with our family several years ago. And it was because I found that most psychiatrists were just like, no, just let them fail. Let them do what they want. They'll figure it out. But I don't want to be there to pick up all the pieces either. Um, basically, it was don't do anything to upset the child. And I don't think that that's reasonable either. I'm not saying be mean to your children, but it's okay for them to be mad at you that you make them clean your room, their room. You're the parent. It's your house. There's um, sanitary reasons for it. There's, um, you know, if they let something get too bad, it could damage the home. And plus you're teaching them good skills. It's not, and I'm a room is just part of it. It's the big picture of teaching them to be um, part of society, um, to be functioning adults one day. And um, I do like how this guy, the psychiatrist put it together in the self-driven child. Um, cause like I said, we did pull away from a lot of, um, working with, you know, family counselors and psychiatrists because we felt like that they were just coddling children and, you know, letting them just like not upset them in any way. And that's how you fix it in the house. I'm like, I'm not going to tiptoe around children and clean their room for them when they're like 15. Like, it's just, it's not going to happen. Um, Luckily, we stopped this around the same time our now teenagers were young enough that we don't have those issues with them now that they're older. They understand why we want them to do the things that we want them to do. And I am implementing a lot of these things with my younger children, both that we have learned from over the last several years. And so this, the book, The Self-Driven Child, gave me a lot of the science behind why we do it that way. Uh, Teens Unleashed, Unschooling Your Adults, or unschooling young adults um i have just been wanting to dive a little bit more into what unschooling is um i joke that we are traditional eclectic unschoolers because we do have an unschooling component to what we do um i let the kids kind of choose their curriculum based on what their interests are but rather than you know with some i everybody has a different idea of what exactly unschooling is so you know I don't need a, you guys coming with your pit, pitchforks and torches saying that I'm t- doing it wrong. I know I'm, I, I'm just doing it my way. And that's the beautiful thing about unschooling or any type of homeschooling is that you can just do it your way. Um, So I am pretty strict, like you are going to do a math. So I'll let you choose which algebra book you want to choose, but bottom line is you're doing algebra. But then, you know, like for English, my daughter gets really bogged down with the um, the grammar and the spelling because she's dyslexic. So I'm like, you know, for English, what do you want to do? She's like, I'd like to learn creative writing. So I bought her a couple of creative writing um, curriculums and that's what she's working on. Um, so I just really try to focus on what they're more interested in and spend a lot of the rest of our time learning through hands-on on the farm, cooking, running the house. Um, just anything that we're doing. I mean, our well pump went out recently. We had the guy over to fix it. My husband and boys were out there helping the contractor while he was here doing some electrical work and that type of thing. Because we don't do it where we just pay someone to do it. Like this, everything's a learning experience. Um. So yeah, if you're interested in unschooling, um, unschooling your teenagers, Teens Unleashed, it's a great book. The author has written several books on unschooling. So go check her out. All right. The next one is Until the Streetlights Come On. This um, is written by Jenny Urich from A Thousand Hours Outside. I've had her on um, the podcast as well. I... I'm just really enjoying the book. I'm actually not quite done with it, but I thought it could still be on my books. I read this year because I'm 75% done. So (laughs) Um, there's a lot of really fun facts in there and activities to do with the kids that just kind of a little bit more deeper thinking. There's a lot of explanations as to why she has her thousand hours outside movement and the importance of it. Um, I, every once in a while, I like, I 
back up and read out loud what she has to say to the whole family because everyone's been it's been really exciting interesting stuff that the kids have kind of dove deeper into after I read it to them so that's been fun um the last book that I'm about three quarters of the way through is Folks This Ain't Normal by Joel Salatin. Um, if you're a homesteader, been a homesteader for any amount of time, you know who Joel Salatin is. He's like the godfather of permaculture. Um, really enjoying this book. I know he's got several out there. He just came out with another one called Homestead Tsunami. Um, he just has a really different way of looking at life and food and all of it. And I, I just think it's it's a great book that I think everybody should take some time to read, at least to understand the alternative lifestyle of agriculture. Now, books I want to read. Um, so I start every year um, for the last like five years, I started with The Four Agreements um, by Don Miguel Luis. It's a short read. You can maybe do it in a weekend. I need to remind myself of those ag agreements every year. I have a whole podcast talking just about this book and how I feel like it relates to homeschooling and homesteading and that you just need to stick to your own convention convictions and don't listen to what everyone else says to you. Strongly recommend this book. Like make sure you have it. So January 1st, you're reading it. That should be your new year's resolution to read that book. It'll handle the rest. <laughs> Um, so just kind of on my list of what I want to read, this is no way an exhaustive list because my bookshelf is full. My want to read list is full. I don't think I'll ever read every book that I even own, let alone all of them that I want to read. But here's a list of the ones that are kind of sitting higher on my list to be read, like maybe in January. Um, Letters of a Woman Homesteader. It, that's a really short read. I actually I may even read that one before the end of this year. Um, Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Grotto. He's kind of, or G Gatto. Anyways, um, he is one that people really look at on unschooling. He has a couple other books that just talk about how the education system is messed up. And I haven't read any of his books, but I read experts from him. And that's why his books are on my list for sure. Uh, Born in the Country, A History of Rural Living. I don't think you guys need to ask why I want to read that one. I mean, it's just it totally makes sense for me. <clears throat> I'm sure you'll love it too um, if you decide to pick it up. Uh, Last Child in the Woods talks about the epidemic of children not spending enough time in nature. So my cats are starting to be really loud. Um, so let me text someone to come get them. So sorry about that. Um, the next one is the edible history of humanity. I'm that falls in my theme of, you know, finishing the homestead history book that I've been working on. So, I mean, you'll probably notice a lot of the books that I read have to do with the history of food. Um, next is the omnivores dilemma. That's another one that goes along with the history of food. It's going to be very close to animal vegetable junk. It's a very popular book within the homestead community. Uh, the Worst Hard Time, that is a true story of um, the Great Depression and some of the things that are going on with that happened then um, from like a firsthand view. Uh, there's another book called The Indifferent Stars Above that is about the Donner Party. So that's a couple of historical books that I'm really interested in reading this year. And then let's see, I have The Sociology of Food and Agriculture, um, and I have Letters to a Young Farmer. I am about halfway, or a Letter to a Young Farmer. I think it's by Jean Dodson. I'm about halfway through that one, so I'll probably finish that one this week. And that one's been really good as well. There's so many tabs sticking out of it. So this kind of is bringing me to the end of this list. Um, like I said, there are so many more that I couldn't even begin to list them all, but I do have my son logging them, um, logging every book on my bookshelf into my Amazon storefront. So you can get the direct links there and I will get you the link to my Amazon storefront in the show notes. Um, you can also get a list of all these books um, on my Goodreads. Um, just the Amazon one links you directly to be able to purchase it. 
Now, if you're interested in learning about or teaching your kids horsemanship from a world record holding mounted archer, be sure and check out my friend Brandy Van Holden's horsemanship course in the show notes. Um, I hope you guys got something out of this episode. Enjoy reading, share your reading with me, and we'll talk next week. Thank you for joining me today at the Homestead Education, and I hope that I have given you something to think about this week. To help others find me, please comment and leave a review on your favorite podcast player. You can also follow me on Facebook at the Homestead Education and Instagram at Homestead underscore Education. Do you have questions that you would like answered or just want to say hi? Please email me at hello at the homesteadeducation.com. Until next time, keep growing!